Mr. Alley, uh, Boy, now that's a tough act to follow. You know, they said that this International Carnival Glass Convention had more firsts than any other convention that we've ever had. We've had more people attending a convention. We've had more people attending an auction. Auction set a record. A plate set a record. We had a governor address you, and now you got me. <laughs> and you know, I'm more proud of that than you. <laughs> the reason being, not that I know so much about carnival, or not that because I'm such a good speaker, but the reason I'm happy about it is because Carnival Glass and its people have done so much for me. Any little bit that I can give back, I want to do it. That's why I consented when Carl asked me Monday if I would give the presentation that I gave approximately a month ago at Lincoln Land. I said, you mean to say with the same glass? He says, with the same glass. I said, with the same corny jokes? He says, with the same funny stories. So I said, I had come prepared to set up in my room to sell glass. And I don't feel like I want to set up all that glass in my room and take it all down and having to set it up here again and uh, take it down again. So I opted not to take a room in the motel. Instead, I brought the glass here, and uh, we didn't sell any of it. It's all here. The same glass was at the Lincoln Land Convention, and we sold several pieces at that convention, but the people who purchased it consented to let me keep it and show it and pick it up here. So, <clears throat> with that uh, information, I want to tell you a little story about, uh, is Bob Lovell still here or did he leave? How about Mary Alice? Mary Alice is here? Well, then I can't tell that story, can I? <laughs> I'll tell it anyway. I wanted to, uh, if any of you people have noticed, since last year, Bob has put on a little weight. Now, I don't know whether that's good or bad, because I have the same problem. But anyway, his doctor advised him that he should do something about it. And he, his doctor suggested that he might go to a dude ranch and ride horses. Now, riding a horse, you know, doesn't take an awful lot of, of skill, nor does it take an awful lot of real exercise. But, you know, the jiggling gets rid of a little. And so Bob went to a dude ranch and uh, inquired about the fact of spending some time riding horses. And uh, it didn't take long for that dude ranch owner to size Bob up and, and know that Bob knew very little about horses and less about riding them. So he thought he was going to cash in on it. And uh, he said to Bob, uh, I think your doctor has advised you well, and I think that riding horses would do you a lot of good. But in your case, it's going to cost $100 a day. Bob said, $100 a day, you're putting me on. Oh no, he said, for $50 more, we put you on. <laughs> I had some good friends here, 
Who are the Magans? Now you all know the Magans. They have made the lamps that have been auctioned and uh, they have a new camper. And it's parked right out here and he's one of the few that's plugged into the hotel's electricity. How about that? <laughs> Mine sets way out there and I have to use my generator. But anyway, if you know Sue, Sue is one of these southern proper ladies. She never says anything out of order. She uses her choice of words very carefully. And before she went out with Audrey on this trip up here, she wanted to write some of the campgrounds that they were going to stay at to find out about their times. But she didn't dare put anything like that in a letter. And after much thought and much determination, she decided to write the letter and use the word bathroom commode. How are your facilities regarding your bathroom commode? she was going to write. And then she thought that, I don't like that. So I'll just shorten it up to the BC. So how are your facilities the BCs? Well, when that poor campground owner received that letter inquiring about the BCs, he was dumbfounded. And he brought that letter around to many other campers in the campground and said, what in the world is this woman driving at? And finally they decided that that BC meant the Baptist Church. <laughs> so he wrote Sue a letter and I have a copy of that letter. <laughs> Dear Mrs. McGon, now if I crack up reading this letter, it's only because it gets me every time I read it. <laughs> Dear Mrs. McGon, I regret very much the delay in answering your letter, but I now take the pleasure of informing you that a BC is located nine miles north of the campground. <laughs> and it is capable of seating 250 people <laughs> at one time. <laughs> I admit it's quite a distance away if you are in the habit of going regularly. <laughs> but no doubt you will be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along. <laughs> and they make a whole day of it. They usually arrive early and stay late. And the last time my wife and I went was six years ago. <laughs> And the place was crowded. We had to stand up the whole time. It may interest you to know that right now there is a supper being planned to raise money to buy more seats. They're going to hold it in the basement of the PC. I would like to say it pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly. <laughs> but it surely is not lack of effort on my part. <laughs> you know, as we grow older, it seems to be more of an effort, <laughs> particularly in cold weather. <laughs> and so if you come down, decide to come down to our campground, Perhaps I could go with you for the first time <laughs> and sit with you and introduce you to all the other folks. <laughs> Remember, this is a very friendly camera. <laughs> well, that's the story of my friends, the Macabres. <laughs> when I address the Lincoln land, the topic of my address was What's new in old carnival glass tumblers? 
and how it got changed to uh, frolicking bears and things of that nature, I don't know. But anyway, that is what I would like to talk to you about today. What's new in old carnival glass tumblers? And I can answer that in one word, nothing. Nothing is really new. And now I will have to prove that. Now, I think the reason we got off on the wrong start by, you know, talking about the frolicking bear and downplaying the frolicking bear or upgrading the frolicking bear, whatever you want, I do want to say this, that there are not too many people that own a frolicking bear tumbler. And up until a short time ago, the frolicking bear tumbler was the one tumbler that everybody greedy hands had to wrap themselves around. If you owned a frolicking bear tumbler, you had made the scene. At one time, there was only one or two or three or four of those known. Today, there are somewhere between 12 or 15 frolicking bear tumblers known. But it still is the one tumbler that commands the biggest dollar price of any known tumbler. <clears throat> Why that is, I don't know. I think a lot of it has to do with news hype. It has been, you know, talked about, raved about, thought about, hoped about, dreamed about in many, many carnival glass camps. But anyway, how many of you in this room own a carnival glass tumbler? I know there are a couple. Uh, uh, a frolicking bear tumbler. A frolicking bear tumbler. I know the Leonard's own one, and I know the Gallows own one. I, at one time, owned one, but it had a couple of chips on it, so I sent it back to Sam Robert. So I owned it for about an hour. How many of you have ever seen a frolicking bear tumbler? Now there's lots of hands that go up, but the ownerships are very, very limited. Now the point that I want to make is simply this, that all of the tumblers you see here, for the most part, there are maybe one or two exceptions, are rarer than a frolicking bear tumbler. And value-wise are probably about one-tenth of what a frolicking bear tumbler <coughs> would sell for today. Incidentally, six weeks ago I made an offer of $7,500 to a Texas banker who is, you know, they're supposed to be in bad shape, to a Texas banker for a frolicking bear tumbler and could not buy it. So you see the value of that tumbler still holds even today. <clears throat> I want to go through some of these tumblers with you because they're very interesting tumblers. They have interesting histories, they have interesting manufacturers, and they all have somewhat of a story to tell. So on that basis, <clears throat> I hope that without a mic, you'll be able to hear me all well, if all right. <clears throat> now I'm going to prove my ignorance right from the beginning because the first tumbler here, and what I have done here, <clears throat> all of these tumblers are listed alphabetically, A's and B's and C's down the line, and I wanted to get one from every alphabet if I could. I had an Aztec. In fact, the Aztec that I had to bring here was the very one that was photographed and shown in the Owens Carnival Glass book. But before I could put my act together, I sold that tumbler, and I have here the Apollo II. I know very little about this tumbler, but there's not too many people that know more than I do about it. So I really don't feel too bad. 
undoubtedly it is from an overseas uh, manufacturer, certainly was not manufactured in this country, but it's a very, very pretty little tumbler. Almost a juice size as opposed to some of these as regular glass size. This band of diamonds is no stranger to most of you people. What may be strange about this one is its color. The one that you see most often is a purple. Now a purple is not common. It's an Australian tumbler, but this one is amber, and that is what makes it extremely rare. There are possibly in this country only three or four of these amber banded diamond tumblers around. This one I sold to Mr. Bechtold in uh, Lincoln Land. This band of roses tumbler I purchased from uh, the auction of uh, Don Moore. Don Moore had an auction last fall and this tumbler was in that auction and uh, also a water set was auctioned in that tumbler and I purchased both of them. This tumbler was made by the uh, Crystallarius Glass Company which had a branch in Mexico and also in Argentina. Whether this came from the Argentina plant, which I think it did because of literature that I have seen from the Argentina plant or from the Mexico is not certain, but it definitely is from one of the other and it is a very, very beautiful tumble with a band of roses encircling the entire tumble and fluted on the side. <clears throat> this is the big butterfly. There was one of those offered at the sale yesterday. It was not purchased. It was stolen. Twelve hundred dollars was a giveaway price. Most of these tumblers are selling in the $3,000 range. So John, you bought a value. That was one of the bargains in the, in the sale. Incidentally, the thing about this big butterfly tumbler and the one that was sold yesterday is the fact that it establishes the fact that there are now known, there are two known colors because the one in the Owens Book of Tumblers is definitely a marigold. This is a green, the same color green of the frolicking bear, that drab green. And I don't think it is as pretty as the marigold, but it establishes the fact that there are now two known colors in the big butterfly. I think Lee might have more information on this because when these surfaced about two years ago, I think Lee was in the act of the possibility of purchasing them, and I don't know whether he did or not, but anyway, talk to him later about it. We have to hurry on. This is Blocks and Arches. Beautiful little satin, satin finish uh, tumbler. Also, uh, from Australia uh, manufacture, and <clears throat> it is very, very rare with a nice satiny finish. <clears throat> there are only few of those that are in the United States. <clears throat> this tumbler is called the Cape Cod. Now we know this tumbler is an old imperial pattern. They packed peanut butter in glass in that uh, pattern years ago in New England. Uh, there's a real history with this, and I, I can't afford to go into it all, but when I purchased this tumbler uh, a few years ago from John Britt, he says, the only thing I know about this tumbler is that it's pretty and rare. <coughs> there are only six known. There have been no more that have ever surfaced, and uh, uh, one of them is owned by Magan. Another one is owned by Bob Leonard. I own one and there's three more out there someplace. So, very rare 
very beautiful little tumbler. That is a smoky amethyst. The color is a smoky amethyst. The next tumbler we have here is the Faustoria Glass Company Chain and Star. Another tumbler that you just never hear of, much less have an opportunity to see. A chain and star. A beautiful little tumbler, and there's only about four or five of these known uh, in the hands of collectors. The next tumbler we have here is the circle scroll. Now, all of you know a circle scroll tumbler. Uh, it's not that rare, but a purple is extremely rare color. One sold at auction, Elmer Hart purchased it at auction uh, about a year ago and paid over $2,000 for it. Who was at that auction? It was out east. Yeah. That's when uh, uh, Ruth Steinstoff paid, what was it, $6,000 for that green thing. Elmer Hart purchased one of these for over three to two thousand dollars. There's very, very few of these purple tumblers known. The next tumbler here is the concave diamonds. Now here again, we don't have a rare tumbler as far as pattern is concerned, but we have an extremely rare <coughs> color. The blue is quite common. The Vaseline is quite rare, but the olive green is very, very seldom seen. And if you have the coaster with it, it makes it that much more valuable. I have the coaster, but I did not take the coaster with me. Now, one thing you've got to say about tumblers, they make a beautiful display, don't they? I don't think there's any product in the Carnival glass line that is more that is less attractive than a carnival display. You know when uh, when uh, Don Adam or uh, Jack Adams will show his glass tonight, or when uh, Don Moore shows his glass, you've got plates and you've got bowls and you've got plates <coughs> and you've got funeral vases and you've got all that beautiful glass. There's a lot of variances, but tumblers, you know, you, you can't make really attractive display of tumbler. But whenever you do, this one always seems to be outstanding. <coughs> For all of its plainness, there's something outstanding about the Coleman Tide tumbler that attracts and gravitates people. <coughs> very, very rare tumbler. The coin spot tumbler, again, a very common tumbler except when it's in the variant. The coin spot has seven <coughs> rows of coin spots. This one has five. I'm trying to find that in the marketplace. Very, very rare. This Cosmos, again, a very, very rare intaglia pattern. Very beautiful. <coughs> in fact, some of these Intaglia pattern tumblers, in my estimation, are the most underrated pieces of carnival glass that there is. Now, I'm not speaking primarily of this because it's so rare, but when you get to, a, for example, a 474 or a fashion, some of the most beautiful, delicate patterns come in those colors. This is a diamond and ovals. <coughs> this is an English pattern. It came, comes from a tumble upset where you have the water thing and this sets on top of it. This is part of that set. This is not a rare tumbler in name. It's a diamond lace. The rarity is again in its color. One of those few instances where marigold is the rarest color. <coughs> we see this in purple, but we very, very seldom see it in diamond lace. The drapery, here again, is a very rare color. For many years, this tumbler was thought to be made by uh, uh, or come from England. It has been established through research that this is made by the Riyamaki 
uh, glass company from Finland, and it is very rare, rare color. And while I was at the auction or at the convention, I was able to buy the little drapery variant. This was brought over from England by Ray Nove, sold to John Britt, and John sold it to me just the other day. Extremely rare little piece. If you think this one's tough to get, try to find this one. So now we have the pair together. Here's what I'm talking about in the fashion, beautiful intaglia pattern, <coughs> underrated tumbler, even in its marigold color, it's beautiful, but in purple, it's exceptionally rare. I've inserted a few uh, enamel tumblers simply because uh, I thought you might be interested. This is what they call the little fancy flowers. It's also a little, very rare little tumbler. There's a punny band down there, we'll get to that, and a windflower and so forth. This Fantonia fruit is rare because it is different than the Fentonia pattern. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the difference of that, and I don't have to go into a lengthy discourse on that, but it is extremely rare little time, very, very solemn. And the reason I don't want to spend a lot of time with that is because I have brought here a field flower tumbler, and this has got to be one of a kind. This is the new uh, I.G. Fenton uh, red tumbler. This is an old pattern and it is red. The only known red tumbler, it's Mary, it's Amberine on the bottom, but the one high up top is just as brilliant red as you find. And I brought the two together so that you can compare them. You see the old and the, the new and the old. The flute and cane. We hardly knew that this, we knew the uh, uh, water pitcher existed, but we did not know what existed in this until just recently a few of these surfaced and we have two sizes in this. We have this, which is almost a lemonade size, <coughs> and the regular size, which I have not brought along. This little flute number three, again, is not a rare pattern, but the blue is extremely rare. It is a beautiful cobalt blue. <clears throat> Tom Burns had an auction not too long ago, and in that auction <coughs> was a blue flute number three, and he had behind it, I had never no one existed. I had this in my collection at that time, but I don't know what that one sold for. This little uh, orange tree <coughs> is a variant, simply because it doesn't have the beating of the, which is normal on the uh, orange tree uh, mm -hmm. Now. Talking about variants, I did a show, and I want to thank Gary. I did a show in Florida a few years ago on variants, tumbler variants. You know how many variants there are in just in tumblers? I called it the 57 varieties after the Heinz thing. There are something like 70 different variants in, in tumblers alone. <coughs> most of them are in the flutes, and most of them are also in uh, 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 scrolls, in tears. We'll get into some of those a little later. Uh, this is a 49er. This little tumbler, <coughs> you've heard of it, very rare piece. Uh, someone asked you, yeah. Uh, asked me, Donna asked me, do you, boy, do you have a 49er? And I said, yeah, there's one up there. That's when we came up there to take a look at this one. This little 474, John has this color also in his room. Do you not, John? This aqua? 
it is very, very rare color in that pattern. It isn't a rare uh, pattern, but it certainly is a rare color. Now, when I did the Lincoln Land, I called this perfection. And the people were so gracious, they never called the error until after the show. But this is the gay 90s. One of the most difficult tumblers to find in the Millersburg pattern, especially in the Marigold, is this beautiful little gay 90s. I bought this tumbler here because it's different. It's a grape and cable, and most of you are familiar with grape and cable. There's not a great deal you can say about grape and cable, purple, but there's something extremely different about this one. It could be that this was in the Ludeman collection when it was here seven years ago. I can't say for sure, but it's possible. There's only two of these known. And the thing that makes it so distinguishing is the fact that it has, it's tankered for one thing, it's stippled for another thing, and it has straight up sides for another thing. There's only two known like that. The field flower tumbler is, again, not a tumbler that's rare, but the color of amethyst is certainly rare. You find very few of these. I think there's only four, five, six of these that are known. You see a lot of these tumblers, <clears throat> what we call the heart band tumbler, in red flash. But in Carnival, you see very few. And then when you see them, you see very few in marigold or lavender or in green. Very, very rare colors. <clears throat> this tumbler, <clears throat> I'm sure you're familiar with, is called Hobnail. What makes this a little bit different is this is one of two known. About five years ago, I purchased from Joe Crothers a hobnail green water pitcher. He would not sell the water pitcher, uh, or he had a, a tumbler with it, a green tumbler with it. He would not sell the tumbler without selling the water pitcher. So I, I bought it. And uh, uh, Mrs. Whitley wanted it more than I did, so I sold it to her, and we found another green one. And so this makes two green tumbler. This is probably the ugliest tumbler in the, in the, in the uh, display. It's a Hopstar in shield. It, although it is quite homely and doesn't have a lot of color, it has a fly in it. But anyway, it, uh, it is a rare tumbler, very seldom seen, and very hard to buy. <clears throat> this inverted feather is also a very, very difficult tumbler. There are only two known water pitchers. I have one at home, and <clears throat> this tumbler is a perfect match to it. And while I was here, I was able to purchase a green one also, which is almost equally as difficult to find as the marigold. <clears throat> this beautiful little, uh, help me out. This one is also, look at the color on that and look at the satiny finish on it. It is just beautiful. Someone asked me, what is my favorite in there? And I said, the mother fruits and flowers, I think. But I think this is, you know, th there's something about this that really, really is very attractive. And it is very, very rare. Now, if, if you want to play favorites, this is a very, very hard one not to consider. Because this is what I say to my grandchildren. These are the three bears and tumblers. This is for Papa Bear, this is for Mama Bear, and this is for Baby Bear. And <clears throat> these little Jacobean Ranger tumblers are very, very rare and very hard to come by. You never see them in an auction. Maybe you'll see one, but it'll be a long time before you ever see all three of them together. The regular tumbler, the juice tumbler, and the shot glass. They also made this, I believe, in a taller tumbler. Did they, John? 
in a uh, lemonade size. Now this is a very inexpensive tumbler, and I don't know why it's so inexpensive, because it is very rare, and that's called a coca bowl. It's listed in the uh, Owens Book of Tumblers, but why you never see that tumbler in any flea market or any auction or any uh, Kokomo, just like Kokomo, Indiana. Very rare little piece. <laughs> then I have a, a white uh, milk glass, iridized, and uh, that too is an extremely little rare piece. This one has come to light recently, is called the Long Buttress. Again, it is a foreign-made tumbler and very rare, very rarely seen in this country. And probably along with that field flower red, this is probably the, the showstopper of the afternoon. This is a luster rose in a moonstone. Never known to exist. And here we have one. Talking with Fenton at the convention last year, he feels that both that field flower and this were made as experimental pieces. And now that you know that's not authority. We think we haven't done all research on these yet, but it is extremely, extremely rare. This little green, my lady, <clears throat> there's only three of those known. I own two of them, and Cecil Whitley owns the other one. I have one for sale. <laughs> now we're getting into these two pieces that I talked about, about being favorites. And I think one of the reasons they're favorites is because of the extraordinarily brilliant iridescence on these tumblers, put out by Millersburg, both in the Morning Glory and in the Multi Fruits and Flowers. Now, what, do you, what more do you have to say about tumblers with that type of quality? You know, they just speak for themselves. And the rarity, I think you all know. This little near cut tumbler, uh, Northwood near cut, again, an extremely rare tumbler and very beautiful little tumbler too in the intaglio pattern. Uh, I'm going to skip over that because we went over that with that art band before. This is the Oklahoma tumbler, also a very, very rare tumbler. It seems like most of these tumblers, along with Rising Sun and the Aztec, were found in that southern southwest part of the United States. That's where most of them are found, a lot like frolicking bears. Most frolicking bears were found in the Indiana area, and most of the big butterflies were found in the Indiana area. For some reason, these tumblers, we feel, were made by that crystallarious glass company in, in Mexico and uh, Argentina. This is an <laughs> I really do not like to show this tumbler because it does nothing for me except the fact that I put it in here and it's extremely rare. It's paneled grape and leaves, but you know, there's very little iridescence in, on it and it is uh, not too attractive a tumbler, but it is tough to buy. I think when I purchased this at an auction, it set a new high in, in uh, tumbler prices other than, you know, Big Butterfly or uh, Frolicking Bear. And my wife thought, sure, that I had gone off the trolley. I paid $2,100 for this tumbler simply because it is one of two known. It is the Marigold Peach. It, you know, it is one of those rarities again where the marigold color is the rare color when we know it to be very prominent in blue. Now here's another one of these Millersburg pieces in the perfection. The green being very rare, the marigold probably being the rarest yet, but this is a very rare piece, but it's a beautiful matching piece to the water pitcher that I own. This too is the punty band, the high Z punty band uh, in the enamel. Here again, 
you never see that <coughs> displayed, you never see it offered for sale, you never see one up for auction. This is a ribbed swirl. That's what I was talking about. There are so many variations in these swirls, both on interior patterns and exterior patterns. And this one is probably the rarest of all of the swirl type patterns. This is the Marigold Rising Sun. Now I've got to tell you a story about this. I knew there were blues in the Rising Sun. <clears throat> so in the Hoga paper, in the bulletin, I advertised, you know, in the safe for sale and wanted. I listed a, a bunch of wants. One of them was a blue rising sun. Never got a phone call, never got a reply from any of them. Until about 30 days later, I received a airmail letter from Argentina. And a guy says, I have a blue rising sun tumbler. How much will you give me for it? Well, you know, that's like saying, uh, <clears throat> What's a 1916 Cadillac worth? What are you looking for? <clears throat> so it began a correspondence. And the correspondence resulted in the purchase of not only this tumbler, but all of the other tumblers that you see right here, these five right here. Two of them are completely unknown patterns. Beautiful, extremely, and these incidentally were made by that Crystallarius Glass Company in Argentina. Just extremely <coughs> beautiful patterns, and especially this tiger lily with a blue base. Unheard of color, an unheard of pattern. Here is the one that's made in this country. The detail is much finer. The whole base is different. The height of the tumbler is shorter. An extremely rare and beautiful piece as opposed to this. And you can look at these. And, and along with that, we'll come to that in a minute here, <coughs> is the Quebec or omnibus, as it is sometimes called. I have it here in the uh, Marigold. Where is it? Oh, right. No, that's right here. Is that it right there? Here? No. Well, anyway, I thought I had it. But anyway, the omnibus, <coughs> again, in the blue. And they did a fantastic job in those blues. Well, anyway, those five tumblers came from Argentina. And I just received them, I would say, about 60 days ago. Just a little bit ago. This also came out, no, it didn't either. I was going to say out of the Moore auction, but this John picked up for me someplace. It's called the Rose Window. Beautiful Gothic type uh, uh, pattern in there. And very nice, deep marigold color. And a very, very rare piece. <coughs> Until. <coughs> That field flower was found. This was the only red carnival tumbler I had in my collection. And it's not a tumbler as we would call a tumbler. On the bottom of that is a lot of printing, and we call it the Sacramental Light. There is a company in Syracuse, New York. They do not manufacture the tumbler. They get that from somebody that uh, I'm not aware of, but they use it as a candle, and it's used in religious <coughs> ceremonies. So it's really not a tumbler, but it's just a piece of probably. Here's probably the most disputed piece of, of glass in the entire bunch, the S repeat. I don't think we'll ever have a <coughs> complete meeting of minds as to the authenticity of this tumbler. Is it old or is it new? Well, I think there are more of my peers that feel it to be old than there are those who feel it to be new. So I will cast my lot with the old. 
Anyway, it is extremely beautiful. If you compare this tumbler with a jeweled heart, you will see that some of the artwork and some of the finish in, on this tumbler is very, very similar to a jeweled heart and certainly is a very beautiful tumbler. <clears throat> this is uh, Northwood Stretch uh, Diamond and Hopstar and I'm sure all of you know the rarity of that tumbler. Very, very beautiful and rare. <clears throat> This is called the Sweetheart Tumbler. This also is pictured in the Owens Book of Tumblers, but again, a very, very rare tumbler. This is called the Sydney Tumbler. Again, a tumbler that is more than likely made in Australia. It has nice uh, light uh, marigold color. Beautiful, beautiful design. This <coughs> vintage banded is very familiar to all of you in the uh, mug. Very common in mug. A marigold mug sells for $15 and you're probably lucky if you get that for it. But this is worth probably about 100 times more than a mug. Very rare piece. Extremely rare piece. Very hard to find. I've seen one or two of these around in the show today. The white panel and the blue. <clears throat> Just because we see a couple of them in the show does not mean that it's not a rare pattern because it is an extremely rare pattern. Very beautiful and in a nice blue. This western thistle also, again, an extremely rare pattern. Very seldom seen. Only four or five of these that are known. This white oak I purchased also at the convention during this past week, and the reason I bought it, it is one of the few white oaks that I have ever seen that does not have little nicks, not on the outer part of the rim, but on the inner part of the rim. And how they ever get there, I don't know. But any white oak tumbler that you see check for those little nicks on the inner part of the rim down here, not on the outer rim. This one has absolutely none. It is perfect. This little wind flower is also a, a rare little tumbler in the uh, marigold, in the enameled flower. Yeah. Oh, oh no, this is that rising sun. Now, this is the last one we have here in the old tumblers, and this is the wisteria pattern. Uh, these, three tum uh, these tumblers were made only in the three pastel colors, the white, the uh, pastel blue, and the pastel green. And this is the rarest of the three colors. There's very, very few of these. Now, I told you the history of these tumblers here. And now I'm going to tell you the history of these tumblers. All of you recognize this as a grape and gothic arches, common pattern. All of you recognize this as diamond lace. You've never in your life seen a white diamond lace, have you? And this is an entirely different green. <clears throat> now if you were in the opalescent room and saw the display of all the opalescent glass, there was also a display of opalescent tumblers. All of the tumblers on that display were old pattern glass which was iridized by Terry Kreider. There are no known opalescent tumblers in old carnival glass. Some of them, you know, you can stretch the imagination and say that sure looks like opalescent, but it is not. There are no known opalescent tumblers. No. But these <coughs> are old pattern glass and some extremely beautiful glass. And the, the one thing I want to stress is its rarity. These are almost one-of-a-kind pieces simply because 
they were iridized by Terry, and when he reheated this old glass, the breakage on that glass was phenomenal. And it didn't take him long to quit iridizing glass. So we don't have many pieces of his in the old pattern glass. Now we do have some of the new glass, reproduced glass, that he has iridized, and that's a different matter. But this is all old pattern glass, just like this old Gibson girl here, which he has iridized, and makes for a beautiful little glass. Also comes under the heading of carnival glass. Now you're all invited to come up and look at the glass. Uh, be careful with you, when you handle it and put it down because they are very rare pieces. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them, either from the floor or up here. Well, that concludes my presentation of glass. But I always want to do this one thing, which most carnival glass uh, people do, and that is this. If you melt that glass down to its original stage, you'd have a little pile of sand. That's all you'd have. But the friends remain forever. Thank you.
Less than a dozen rows. I would say not.